Good afternoon and welcome to you all for the first of our winter lecture series in our second year of doing lectures here at the River Center. Um, we're very excited to have you here. And the focus of our, of our uh, topics this year is building a sustainable future. So we, we're going to ask that you all keep yourselves on mute so that we can hear Richard's presentation without any interruptions. And um, we will be recording this session. So just be aware that that is going on. And um, then it will be available on our website after the presentation, as well as, um, as, well as on our website. And Richard will have it as well. Uh, we have three more talks coming up in this series, one per month. Uh, we have the Blue Revolution with Nick Sullivan, a, a very interesting speaker. And um, uh, Steve's asking me to speak up. I don't know if we can turn me up, but uh, the volume control is over on that computer. But I will speak a little louder. How's that, Steve? Good? Okay. Uh, we have uh, Tom Kearns, who is the architect who actually did the renovation of our beautiful river center here, is going to be speaking uh, in March. And then our third speaker is Madeline Ostrander, who's written a really interesting book called At Home in an Unruly Planet. So thank you for coming tonight. And um, we are really pleased and honored to have Richard Heinberg here as our first speaker. He's got an incredible, incredible resume. Um, he's done very multiple books. Um, we have his book here. Here it is, Power, and we're hoping some of you might purchase it tonight, um, not, not to do too hard to sell. Um, it's Prospects for Human Survival, and it can be purchased also at Partners Village Store. He's done hundreds of lectures on energy and climate issues, and he's been on talks in six continents. He's been on NPR, so that's already the certificate of approval in my book. Um, and he's appeared in films, which I didn't know until yesterday, including one with Leonard DiCaprio's 11th Hour. So I'm not going to say too much more, but I am truly honored that he came to our speaker series willingly and is going to be doing a wonderful talk today. Thank you. All right, we're going to put ourselves on mute now. Okay, well, thank you so much for that kind introduction, and thanks so much for the uh, invitation to uh, come and talk to you all. I'm going to share my screen now so I can show you a few slides while I'm talking. Um, what I want to do over the next uh, 40 minutes is walk you through some of the main points of my most recent book, Power. Uh, and this book is really the culmination of many, many years of, of research and, and thought. And my objective with the book wasn't really just to kind of solve this problem or that problem, but to try and step back and gain some perspective on the human condition in the 21st century. Because uh, as I think you probably would agree with me, it's, it, it really seems like things are coming to a head in terms of our, our human situation and relation, not just to each other and, you know, the economy and all that stuff, but uh, humanity vis-a-vis -vis or, or versus planet Earth, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. Um, so the, the book was motivated by three big questions. Uh, the first one, how have we just one species out of millions become so powerful as to bring the whole planet to the brink? Uh, and why and how have we developed so many ways of oppressing and exploiting one another? Another big question. And then finally, is it possible to change our relationship with power to avert ecological catastrophe, uh, while also, you know, averting some of the of the intrahuman uh, crises that 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 we're facing. So, first of all, what is power? Um, I I decided to focus the book on power because I, as I've come to see over many many years, power is really at the heart of just about everything. Um, why so? Well, for one thing, power is in its most basic sense, if you ask a physicist, what is power? She or he will say, well, it's the rate of energy transfer. Energy is everything. So um, 
we use energy to do literally everything we do. So you could say power is the ability to do something. And that's how we often use the word in ordinary conversation, the power of flight, the power of speech. But we also, in English, now it's, this isn't always true in other languages, but in English, the word power also relates to social power, which is the ability to get somebody else to do something. And we spend a lot of time focusing on that uh, uh, among ourselves. We are a very social animal, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, so social power has a couple of brands, a couple of varieties. One is horizontal social power, where we just all pitch in and do something together. But there's also vertical social power, which is uh, uh, the reason I call it vertical is because it it tends to uh, there tend to be some people who have more vertical social power than others. It's the ability of some people to get a lot of other people to do something. And that's usually mediated by incentives and threats, uh, rewards and punishments of various kinds. And then, of course, the way we use the word power in conversation can relate to all kinds of other things, inspiration, ideas, force of personality, so on. All of those are, are perfectly valid meanings of the word power, but, but it's helpful, I think, to tie it all back to that very first definition that I used having to do with energy, because as, I, as I've already said, energy is everything. If you want to understand any organism, ecosystem, human society, follow the energy or follow the power. Um, so this is a a theme, a thread that ties together uh, everything from astrophysics to cell biology, um, all the way down to um, the subatomic realm. And certainly everything in human societies, human history can be better understood if we have a grasp on, on the nature of power, how it arose, what it means, and so on. From the standpoint of energy, Life is incredibly powerful, uh, and this is a this is a, an amazing little factoid I came, I came across in doing my research on a gram for gram basis. The average organism, including us, is ten thousand times as powerful as the sun. Well, how could that possibly be? Well, it's because the sun is just incredibly massive. Living things have evolved to be very very good at capturing ambient energy, almost all of it from the sun, and storing it and making use of it, directing it toward their, their survival uh, activities. So this is, uh, this, this is important to remember for, for a little later in the presentation where we start talking about fossil fuels. So human power has uh, evolved over hundreds of thousands of years, and especially the last few tens of thousands and a uh, few thousand years. Uh, and I tell that story in some detail in the book. I'm not, I'm going to skip over most of it now because, you know, you, most of us have at least a grasp of the outlines of how, you know, fire tools, clothing made us much more formidable uh, in our environments as compared to other uh, species, other organisms. Language, I think is, overappreciated in some ways and underappreciated in others, uh, underappreciated in the sense of just how formidable language made us, the ability to cooperate, to teach others how to make uh, more sophisticated tools, um, how, how to uh, uh, share those skills over time and space. Uh, it was just an enormous advantage. But most of those those uh, early adaptations took place within the context of horizontal social power. Uh, not to say that vertical social power did not exist at all uh, in hunter-gatherer societies. Uh, it did in vestigial forms. But when we get to early state societies, societies that uh, uh, that had agriculture, metal weapons, uh, uh, writing and so on, suddenly vertical social power really gets a hold. And we're talking about early 
uh, kingdoms, societies organized around a hereditary passage of uh, governmental power. Uh, and this has just been the last about the last 6,000 years or so. And there was there were some key uh, developments that enabled this uh, coalescing of vertical social power. One was money. Uh, money is, in a sense, a, a crystallization of social power. If social power is the ability to get other people to do things, well, if you have enough money, you can get other people to do all kinds of things. And so, you know, economists talk about money as if it were just a neutral medium of exchange. It's far from that. Money is social power. But weapons are also a way of uh, gaining or using social power. You can you can threaten people into doing all kinds of things. You can also inspire or convince people to do all kinds of things using communication technologies, of which the first was writing. And uh, you know some of the very first books, the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, you know consisted of stories that ended up in the Bible that which, you know, the word Bible just means book. So, you know, some of the very first writings are still resonating down to us today, uh, shaping people's behavior thousands of years later. Uh, all of these early state societies uh, had slavery, human slavery. It's a, an, a, a human institution that is, you know, really uh, naked, uh, extreme example of vertical social power has been with us for a long time. The thing, the thing is about these uh, these state societies, first kingdoms and then empires, is that they tend to be uh, they they tend to rise and fall in cyclical patterns. And there are a number of social scientists who've who've gathered you know huge data banks of uh, quantifiable information about hundreds of uh, human societies over the last uh, two, three thousand years, and uh, combing over that in immense amount of information, they've they've found you know reliably there are these these cyclical patterns of advance and retreat. Collapse, as it turns out, is a normal and predictable periodic feature of complex human societies. So why we think we can uh, evade that, I, I don't know. Anyway, get back to that later again. Um, so we've had state societies for 6,000 years and gradually with the advance of technology, better navigation, bigger, bigger sailing ships, uh, better weaponry and, and so on, they gradually grew in influence and scope. But then something happened 200 years ago that was just off the charts, and that can be traced to fossil fuels. Remember how powerful life is, 10,000 times as powerful as the sun? Well, that was true of ancient single-celled uh, aquatic plants, too. They were incredibly good at, at aggregating energy from the sun and storing it. And then when they were buried in sediment and slowly cooked over time so that uh, carbohydrates turned into hydrocarbons, they became the greatest energy source the world had ever seen. Uh, it took some, it, uh, some prior developments before humanity could start accessing fossil fuels in large quantities. And the way we know this is that we've done the experiment a couple of times in history. The first time was about a thousand years ago. Uh, China almost had an industrial revolution. They were using more and more coal. They had private ownership of natural resources. They had a, a, a culture of incentives for invest in, for innovation. And the Chinese were inventing all kinds of things from movable type to gunpowder to uh, big sailing ships with a crew of a thousand on and on and on. So why didn't the industrial revolution really take off with China a thousand years ago? Because they had a ruling hereditary elite who saw these new industrialists as competition and they shut the process down. So then it started again in Britain uh, 
roughly 300 years ago. But this situation was different. Britain certainly had a, a ruling hereditary elite, but Britain had had just been in the previous couple of centuries through a process of colonization, taking over much of the rest of the planet, extracting resources, shipping them, cheap labor, all of this stuff. And that had already created a, a, a commercial merchant class that was already successfully challenging the power of the aristocracy. So that opened the way then for a, a new power center in society to really gain hold the not just fossil fuels, but all of the technologies that then flowed from fossil fuels, the railroads, uh, manufacturing, and so on. And that changed everything. This is what agriculture looked like before fossil fuels. This is what it looks like today. You know, it used to take 80% of the population or more to produce enough food for everybody else so that we could have maybe 10%, 20% of the population living in cities and specializing in other activities, right? Well, now it only takes a couple of percent of the population, maybe 1% of the population to grow enough food for everybody else. So what happened to all those other people? Well, they gave up farming, moved to cities and took up jobs in manufacturing, sales, marketing, you know, you name it. Uh, this is a graph from U.S. Department of Agriculture. And I ask, what does this graph gloss over? Well, the, the way they label it on their website is farm jobs as a percentage of total U.S. jobs. Well, hey, wait a minute. In 1790, all those people didn't have jobs on the farm in the sense that, you know, somebody was paying them wages. They were either enslaved persons or they were small landholders. And in some cases, they were large landholders who, who uh, had enslaved persons working for them. Um, <clears throat> the whole idea of mass employment, of everybody having a job, uh, either as an hourly worker or a salaried worker, that's a very modern idea. And it comes from industrialization and it comes ultimately from fossil fuels. That's just one instance of how fossil fuels have reshaped the modern world uh, willy-nilly. Uh, here's a, a little slide from Investopedia showing the economy as most economists now envision, envision it uh, with uh, producers and consumers. I, I added the little question here. What's missing in this picture? Uh, well, the earth, you know, all the resources that go into enabling the economy to work, energy is also out of the picture. Rather than uh, economists, rather than crediting fossil fuels with all of this energy that makes all this happen, they say, well, it's all just supply and demand, it's producers and consumers, it's, it's labor and capital. Those are the big ingredients in the economy that that modern economists talk about. And everything else, they just gloss over natural resources, energy, fossil fuels. It's just taken for granted. So what happened as a result of this enormous influx of, of energy? Well, it enabled economies to grow at a scale and scope and speed completely unprecedented in all of human history. And economists looked at this and they said, well, this is as a result of human ingenuity. Again, forget fossil fuels, forget uh, natural resources. It's all human ingenuity. And because human ingenuity is limitless, and we could talk about that, I don't think it is, but the, the, again, they're saying because human ingenuity is limitless, therefore economic growth should be able to go on literally forever. It's always a good thing and uh, and we should always have it as a goal. But it's an insane idea once you examine it. I mean, if you know even a little bit of, of math, uh, anything that's growing on a, at, say, 1% annually is doubling every 70 years, right? So economists want the economy to grow between 2 and 3% per year, which means, in effect, they want the economy to double in size every 25 years or so. But think about that. The amount of resources that we're extracting from the planet right now, we want that amount to double 
25 years from now. And then 25 years from that will be using four times as much, then 25, another 25 years, eight times as much, and so on. Can that really go on forever? Of course not. It's ridiculous. But <laughs> you know, try and find an article on the business page of the newspaper that questions that, that economic orthodoxy. So this is global energy consumption. And and this is a, a graph I look at. Uh, every time I look at it, it's like, wow, oh my God. You know, so there's something more to see in it. I mean, look at uh, the, the 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 rate of growth, the trajectory, trajectory of growth between 1950 and about 1970. That was the fastest economic growth ever seen uh, <clears throat> on planet Earth by human beings. And that's that those were the decades when petroleum oil was really coming on strong. And uh, for those of us who are baby boomers, you know, that basically shaped the contours of our lives. Me, so meanwhile, what are we doing with all of this cheap energy? Uh, among other things, we're growing more food so we can support more people. We reached 8 billion just this last year. You know, we we it, look how long it took us to get to one billion around 1820, and then just all hell breaks loose. And uh, so the the rate of population growth has slowed in recent years. It's uh, instead of two percent as it was in the 1970s, it's only one percent now. But it's 1% of a larger number. In the 1970s, the world population was three, three and a half billion. So 2% of that meant that we were adding another billion people every 12 years. Today, it's 1% of 8 billion, which means we're adding another billion people every 12 years. <clears throat> so fossil fuels have done so much for us. What's the problem? Well, it was really a bargain with the devil uh, for two reasons. First of all, fossil fuels are, of course, finite, depleting natural resources. And far too little is said about that. Um, and I'll come back to it. The other reason it's a bargain with the devil, of course, is climate change. We know that burning fossil fuels releases um, greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, but I just want to make the point here that climate change is not just a technical problem that we're going to solve with new technology. It's a problem of power. And let me explain why that's so. Uh, first of all, here's you know just a picture of greenhouse gas emissions. They're still going up despite everything we're doing. Uh, installing more solar panels and, and wind turbines and so on. The only, as you'll see here, the only times when greenhouse gas emissions have gone down historically were times when the economy was contracting because of COVID, the global financial crisis, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this pattern goes, goes back to the beginning of, of the industrial revolution. Uh, this is CO2 levels in the atmosphere. And as you can see, it's a pretty steady march upward. Uh, we've had all of these climate conferences and all kinds of promises have been made. Uh, oh, yes, we're going to keep CO2 emissions to the level where we can you know, keep warming to 1.5 degrees. But actually, not much has changed. We're still on the same trajectory we were back in the 1990s. Uh, and actual warming. Uh, Global warming index, a summary of temperature readings all around the planet uh, on an annual basis shows this. There's a lot we don't know about climate change, uh, climate sensitivity, how much temperature increase will occur with uh, each new increment of CO2. Well, that, you know, we know that better than we do, did a few years ago, but it's there's still a lot of, uh, of unknown there. Feedback tipping points, uh, you know, when when glaciers melt, when ice caps melt, uh, opening, you know, black ocean water that absorbs a lot more heat than ice, which, you know, reflects sunlight back into space. So absorbing that much more heat, that causes even more ice to melt. So it's a re self-reinforcing feedback. And anywhere, anytime you see self-reinforcing feedbacks, it's a, it's a sign of a problem, even in situations where 
we've been conditioned to think of it as a good thing, like economic growth. Uh, so the climate impacts, you know, most of you know all this stuff, you know, drought, storms, flooding, crop failures. Uh, one of the more scary scenarios is where temperatures get to the point where, you know, wet bulb temperatures, combination of, of actual heat and humidity uh, create conditions where human beings can't adapt and simply can't survive. And uh, we could be seeing uh, uh, instances of that occurring just within the next couple of decades in large cities in equatorial regions. So the IPCC, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, of the United Nations, does these scenario uh, uh, exercises where they look at you know, possible patterns of emissions and therefore temperature increase. And the sort of worst case scenario, which they call the business as usual scenario, is RCP 8.5. My colleagues and I at Post Carbon Institute think that's an extremely unlikely scenario. That's the good news. Why? Because we, we think there's just not enough burnable fossil fuel. Uh, it's not like we're about to run out of fossil fuels, but we're extracting them using the low-hanging fruit principle. So we've already got all the cheap, easy stuff. And as time goes on, it gets more and more difficult to get each new increment of coal, oil, or natural gas. And the fossil fuel industry is struggling to find new uh, new reservoirs, new mines, uh, new resources to exploit. So uh, we think that's an extremely unlikely scenario. A much more likely scenario is something like our RCP 4.5, which still takes us to probably uh, two to three degrees Celsius, something like that. Uh, that's that's the most realistic, I think, forecast for where we'll go this, uh, this century, which is pretty bad, actually. Um, the climate target of 1.5 degrees, which is what the uh, IPCC has uh, adopted in Paris Climate Accords, would require a, a near total decarbonization of society by 2035. How likely is that? Frankly, not very. Um, here's US uh, energy consumption by source uh, pretty much currently. This is 2019, but that's, that's the most recent data we have. Um, and renewables are are increasing, but as you can see, it's it's only a, still a fairly small share. And part of that is the problem that uh, renewables produce electricity, and we only use twenty percent of our total energy in the form of electricity. So even once we get all of our electricity from renewables, which you know is is many years away at, at current rates, we'll still only be twenty percent of the way there. Uh, it's a huge job. And there are going to be some things that will be very difficult to electrify. A couple of examples. This is a cement kiln that operates at 1,500 degrees Celsius, 24-7, 365 days a year. They never shut them down uh, because they, they're very hard to restart. Could you operate this thing on electricity? Well, maybe in principle, but it would be much, much more expensive. Nobody's trying to do it. And cement, of course, is the base, the key ingredient of concrete, which is literally the foundation of modern industrial civilization. Even wind turbines get anchored in concrete. Um, then there's aviation. Um, I could go on. Shipping. Uh, oh, there, there are ways of dealing with each of these uh, difficult to electrify uh, situations on a desktop, you know, it, it, using, uh, you know, you could, you can use solar electricity made with, with solar panels to electrolyze water to produce hydrogen and then con combine hydrogen with CO2 captured from the atmosphere to make synthetic fuels to run your airliners on. And there are people experimenting with that now. Again, on the desktop, it's possible to do the experiment and make it work. But at the industrial scale of the, the, the size of the industry that exists now, we're not going to get there by 2035. 
not even close. <clears throat> and then there's the materials requirements. Uh, sunlight and wind are renewable and pretty much free, but the but the technologies we use to capture that energy, the, the, the solar panels themselves, the wind turbines, these require all kinds of materials, many of which are are rare. Uh, and there there have been reports within the last few years issued by everybody from the World Bank to McKinsey and Company and uh, on and on and on, talking about the, the materials challenge for a, um, a full energy transition. Uh, again, it's not going to be easy. So far, even though solar and wind have been growing rapidly, global emissions continue to increase and renewable energy so far is adding to rather than di displacing energy from fossil fuels. Why? Well, a, a large part of that is economic growth. You know, as long as the economy is growing, we're using more energy. So how much of that new energy that we're using is coming from fossil fuels versus uh, alternative energy sources? Still, uh, the lion's share is coming from fossil fuels. You can see that yourself here. Now, if we were actually using less energy, then growing renewables would have more of a chance of, of actually displacing fossil fuels. But nobody wants to talk about that. In my view, uh, climate change should be seen in context uh, of a series of survival level challenges that we're facing this century. Clearly, it's the biggest environmental challenge human beings have created for themselves so far, but it's not the only one. And the other ones that we're facing are, whether they're just as bad or not, I suppose, is, is a subject for discussion, but they're also survival level. We're losing wild nature. 70% uh, of vertebrate and invertebrate animal species, uh, excuse me, Vertebrate and invertebrate animal species have declined an average of 70% in population over the last 50 years. So basically, you know, wild nature is in full retreat. We're depleting not just fossil fuels, but all kinds of other uh, natural resources, including renewable ones like forests and fish, but also non-renewable, everything from copper to uh, to, to sand, which you would think was super abundant, but it turns out the sand we need for uh, silicon and for making concrete and so on is, is getting scarce. Uh, this is just a, a, a picture of where we are in terms of global terrestrial vertebrate biomass. There's humans, there's livestock, and that little 3%, that's all the wild animals in the world. We, we're basically taking over everything. How long can this go on? Uh, a better way of thinking about our, our environmental dilemma this century is not, again, not just in terms of climate change, but I think in terms of overshoot. Overshoot is a concept from population biology where a, a temporarily abundant critical resource enables the rapid growth of a population. Now let's suppose that it's a population of field mice and there's a season of abundant rain. So little plants grow, proliferate that are the food for these field mice. So the population of field mice explodes. So what happens then? Well, the, the predators of the field mice, their population explodes, the hawks and the, and the foxes and so on. But also the field mice start to eat down their food source. So their the carrying capacity of the environment for field mice starts to decline. And so the population of field mice crashes. There's a population crash. Well, in our case, what's happened is fossil fuels have created human carrying capacity that didn't exist before as a result of industrial agriculture, as a result of using fossil fuels to increase the rates at which we can extract other resources and use them, turn, turn them into manufactured products. We've increased the rate at which we can, and the scope in which we can 
uh, move resources from where they're abundant to where they're scarce so that more people can live in those places where resources were formerly scarce. Altogether, we've we've created this, this new carrying capacity for human beings. We're supporting 8 billion humans now, whereas only 200 years ago, we could only support 1 billion humans. But that's based on this temporary abundance of fossil fuels that are about to go away. So this is a big problem. I think it's if we think in terms of, of overshoot, and if we think of climate change as one of the symptoms of overshoot, I think we have a more accurate view of what's really going on. Uh, the difficulty in terms of replacing fossil fuels with, uh, with solar and wind or other alternative energy sources. Uh, something I've written about quite extensively uh, lately, including a, a book a couple of years ago called Our Renewable Future, which you can find for free online to download ourrenewablefuture.org. Um, the difficult, those difficulties stem partly from the intermittency of sunlight and wind. Uh, partly just from the problem of scale, which I've or really already talked about. Um, but there's there's more too. Remember, we've 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 used our physical power over nature also to create more social power. You look at what GDP has done over the last 200 years. It soared upward. We've created enormous amounts of wealth as a result of having great amounts of cheap energy. But where has all that wealth gone? Well, you know, we've had this pattern going back all the way to the first kingdoms that I talked about earlier in the presentation of vertical social power that acts like a wealth pump. Whereas where through trade and taxation, uh, the wealth that gets generated by society tends to be pumped upward to the top of the economic pyramid. And then it, you know, some of it trickles down over time, but it generally tends to accumulate at the top of the economic pyramid. And that's been happening um, with this wealth generated by fossil fuels. And so we have enormous economic inequality. We also have inequality in terms of carbon footprints. You know, what countries are most responsible for climate change? Well, China is now the world's top greenhouse gas, em gas emitter, but you know, on a per capita basis, the United States and Canada are way out ahead. And, and historically, certainly the United States and the European countries are most responsible. So big takeaway from the book, we're not going to be able to solve our survival level environmental problems this century with technology alone. It's going to require self-limitation of power. We are over-empowered in relation to nature. We've taken up too much of the Earth's productive capacity. Uh, we have created too much economic inequality. And those problems are only going to be solved by giving up some of our outsized power, some of our land use, for example, uh, letting some land and ocean area go back to ecosystem recovery, to nature. Uh, rich people are not going to be able to uh, encourage poor people to become rich like themselves just through endless economic growth, which is, that's, the, that's the fairy tale we get told. No, uh, the wealthy are going to have to give up some of their unequal power in order for that to happen. Well, is, it, is that even possible? Is it possible for a species to self-limit its own power? Uh, I devote a chapter in the book to that question. And it turns out absolutely happens all through nature. There's, there's something called prudent predator theory. And there's a lot of evidence for it. It shows that pre predators evolve not to wipe out their prey, they learn how to live in balance with their ecosystems. And indigenous societies do the same thing. Indigenous societies are ones that stay in one place for a long time. So they learn the boundaries, the limits of their ecosystem's ability to provide for them. So they learn how to operate within those limits. Uh, the, the folks who 
created those kingship societies and then spread out around the world through colonization and then fossil fuels. We forgot that lesson. And that's what's getting us. We still limit power in various ways. You know, we keep tyrants from arising, hopefully, through democracy. Uh, you know, we have financial regulations, environmental regulations. Uh, all of these things are ways of self-limiting power. Uh, and there are lots of ways in which we're over-empowered that we have to, you know, we have to self-limit. These are just some examples. So if we can do it, why aren't we doing it enough? Why are we in so much trouble? Well, it's partly because we've had, we've gotten so much power so fast from fossil fuels and we misinterpreted the signals. Instead of thinking, wow, this is a one-time only bonanza, we better use it really wisely so future generations can benefit as well. No, we said, oh, it's because we're so smart. And because we're always getting smarter, therefore we can always have more. And there's no limit. There's literally no limit to how much of nature we can take over. It's a Star Trek mentality that says we are, we've been put here in order to take over not only the whole earth, but cosmic habitat as well. Yeah, we might have to deal with some unruly Klingons along the way, but we're going to take over the whole cosmos eventually. Um, we've got to grow beyond that. So what's actually going to happen over the remainder of this century? It's the pivotal century where humanity is going to come up against the limits that we have been, uh, we have stretched by means of uh, fossil fuels. And those limits are going to snap back. So what happens over the course of the remainder of this century depends on how we re-engage with those limits. And hopefully in a voluntary way and in a cooperative way, because it, there's another way of doing this, which is basically just to fight over what's left. And that's not an unlikely scenario. Um, it's sad that I think too few of us are, are talking about readaptation to limits, because that's the only way ultimately that, that we're going to make it through this century uh, without a, a, a big fight. So what to do? Um, we need to fight vertical power with more horizontal power by building alliances. Uh, we need to build community resilience because there are challenges on the way, no matter what we do. And more resilient societies will be ones that are better capable of surviving the kinds of climate and other uh, shocks that are on the way. Uh, and build trust among each other by living with wisdom, integrity, courage, and compassion. You know, without trust, we're not going to be able to cooperate. And uh, and right now, trust is a is a is a thin kind of thin commodity in in some places like the United States, particularly. I think, uh, you know, realistically, we have to rebuild that community level trust so we can build more community resilience and more resolve to tackle these problems. As I promised at the beginning, this is not just a, a set of you know answers for our our problems it's it's a it's more an, an attempt to arrive at a perspective at wisdom and you know in terms of wisdom i think some of the ancient sages really got it right including uh, the great taoist philosopher lao tzu who said knowing others is intelligence but knowing yourself is wisdom mastering others is strength but mastering yourself is true power. So if you're interested in following the, the uh, information I've just presented in a little more detail, I would recommend the book itself, but also there's a power podcast uh, at Post Carbon Institute, and that's free. You can just go to postcarbon.org and find the, the link to that. And otherwise, um, let's, let's, uh, <laughs> let's have some, some discussions, some questions and answers. Thank you, Richard. What a, what a great presentation. Um, we have one question sitting right next to me, so I'm gonna let Ned speak. 
The woman who um, saw fusion a few weeks ago um, got wonderful uh, publicity and then it stopped. Do you have any insight into how fusion might help with power as we yeah. move forward? I'm not very optimistic about uh, the ability of fusion to uh, help us solve our problems. Uh, and that's for two reasons. First, just the technical problems with fusion are enormous. The, the breakthrough that happened, it has to be put in context. Uh, the energy break even was just in a very limited scale. You, they weren't counting all the energy that was required to build all that infrastructure and and really operate all the machinery. They, they were only counting the energy that just went into that one little explosion. In order to generate fusion power realistically, that little microsecond second explosion would have to be repeated on an ongoing basis, thousands of times per second. It's, I mean, literally, it's if this technology can even work, it's many decades away. So from a st technical standpoint, it's not even worth thinking about. But then for doing the thought experiment, suppose we had limitless energy. What would we do with it? Would we take over even more environmental space? Would we, you know, mine the oceans for materials with which to bring, build more future, more fusion reactors, you know, and it, there has to be an, an end to it, a limit to it, and uh, and I, I think we're we we're, we best use our brain power going there to how to adapt to environmental limits as opposed to how to shatter them with more high powered technology. Michelle, you want to do this next? Um, Mike Sullivan had a question. Um, so this is a complicated question, um, but I think we could get to the, um, the, the the simplest part of it, which is, can you speak to the need for energy storage and, and batteries, mm -hmm. and how are we going? How is that going to play into all of this <clears throat> issue? Right. Um, well, uh, because sunlight and wind are intermittent, we need various technological ways of making up for that intermittency. Battery storage is one, which is very good for diurnal intermittency. You know, you can store energy in batteries for a day, 10 days, whatever. It's less good for seasonal intermittency. So if you need to store energy for six months at a time, you need a different technology from, say, lithium. Uh, and there are folks working on that. Energy storage costs money and it costs energy. So it reduces the efficiency of renewable energy systems in terms of energy in versus energy out. And it increases, increases the costs. So if you're just looking at the cost of a new solar panel versus versus the cost of building a new increment of coal power generation. The solar panel will win every time, but if you're thinking in terms of electricity systems and how to integrate those systems with all of the technology we already have, well, which of course is how utility companies have to think, well, it's more complicated and, uh, and the, the renewable energy system becomes a harder Sell. So uh, we we do need more breakthroughs in terms of energy storage. Uh, I I I think the the energy transition is going to be uh, a challenging challenging uh, 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 <laughs> thing to 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 do. But you know, I think it's it's necessary at some scale because we've built our industrial civilization so much around electricity, especially the last you know couple of decades, where we put all of our information online, financial information, health information, uh, scientific, cultural, so that if the grid goes down permanently, we basically lose human civilization as we know it. So we need some level of grid to, to keep, keep working. And I think renewable energy could do that. I don't think renewable energy is going to be capable of maintaining the level of energy usage that we currently enjoy. Uh, and that's 
that's that's that's what I think would be helpful to have more discussion about because then then it becomes a triage situation. We we start to think about well, what is energy doing for us that's absolutely necessary that what we what we want to maintain and how do we keep that system going versus what is energy doing for us now that actually is not making us any better off? I mean, giant uh, automobiles, whether they're electric or or gasoline powered, are probably not a very good use of resources and and environmental space. Um, and there are there are lots of instances like that. So we have another question that was also it sort of ties in with my my thinking about what you were just saying was talking about the potential for horizontal change and building trust in society. Um, how do we do that? And I think what I was thinking was, you know, how how do we get people to change their behavior um, to expect less <laughs> um, right. in terms of the, the things that they must have or the places they must go or the, you know, all of those things we, particularly in America, become so used to um, satisfying ourselves always. And I think, you know, that idea of, of changing behavior is, is very complicated. Right. Yeah, it is. And there's a, there's a big literature on that. There's a whole movement, uh, mostly in Europe, not so much in the US, called the degrowth movement. And a number of economists have been focusing on this for decades now, actually. How do we, you know, how do we get off our addiction, collective addiction to growth? One of the keys is just changing what we're measuring. We've been measuring GDP as the indicator of economic success. And GDP is just, just all it tells us is how much money is flowing through the economy on an annual basis. And what we really want to know is how are people doing? Are people happy? Are their basic needs being met? Uh, and if we had in, an indicator that told us that, that told us, you know, how are people doing in relation to environmental sustainability? Can we keep living this way for generations and generations successfully? That kind of indicator is what we need. Uh, uh, the nation of Bhutan has been using gross national yeah. happiness as an alternative to GDP. And uh, uh, that would certainly be much better. There are some other folks with other ideas, uh, uh, other indices that could be used, but certainly GDP is. Uh, it's probably one of the worst uh, indicators to pay attention to. Doesn't um, Bhutan also have sort of a countrywide commitment to, um, you know, no carbon, no right. carbon footprint? Yeah. Right. Interesting. How about the issue of, of building trust? How do we, how do we tackle that? Yeah, um, it's not an easy one, but we've got to get to where we can uh, talk to one another again and take our attention away from social media and more back to, uh, you know, face to face discussion. Uh, social media is, you know, I talked about how uh, communication technologies have been tools of vertical social power. Well, the most sophisticated communication technologies we have today are social media. And they are ways uh, for small groups, um, sometimes very wealthy, other times not, small groups to get outsized power by spreading fear, uh, hatred, so on. And, you know, we've got to rein them in. We've, we've got to regulate social media uh, in, a, in a way that's, you know, realistic, get people's attention away from the, the screens and the palms of their hands and back to the real world. Okay, the last question that came in was um, the one about population control. If there were less people on the planet, would we get closer to a balance? And of course, that then becomes, well... <laughs> Who, who who's who are we trimming out of the population? You know, I think that's a really um, complicated question too. I mean, there's you know there are countries that are uh, doing some self regulation on population control. There are countries that are not. Um, but I think if we were to try to tackle that across the globe, you know, you'd have to think about well who's making those decisions and how. Right. 
Yeah, I think that's one of the great failures of the environmental movement in the last four decades is uh, moving away from discussion about overpopulation. Uh, the, the discussion was always around voluntary uh, reduction in fertility by, by promoting education levels and choice among women, especially in poorer societies where there's a culture that is patriarchal and that, you know, equates men's masculinity and authority within, within the household, equates those things with having more children. That's been the, the biggest source of population growth over the past, past few decades. And so changing that culture has been, the, where that's happened, that's been the most successful way of reducing population growth rates. There's an organization that we work closely with called Population Media Center, and they work in uh, the countries with the highest population growth rates by creating media, you, enlisting local writers, artists, musicians uh, to create um, uh, radio programs, soap operas, and things like that that people tune into on a daily basis in, in you know, thousands of villages around a number of countries. And in those scripts, they build in education about, you know, women's self-empowerment, women's with empowerment within the family, including the power of choosing how many children to have. And they've been able to measure the success of those efforts in terms of the amount of money that's spent in creating those, those soap operas. It's far more effective than just, you know, distributing free birth control or something like that, which also is a good idea. But, um, you know, we don't have to go to some kind of, you know, compulsory uh, government uh, instituted ban on births or whatever, not even like the Chinese uh, one child policy. And by the way, China, you, you, I'm sure you've all seen the headlines in, in the newspaper in the last couple of days, China's population starts to shrink. Oh my God, what a horrible thing. The sky's falling. Great. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's exactly what needs to happen. And yes, it creates some, some economic problems over the short run. Uh, Japan's been experiencing that for, for quite a number of years. Japan's population has been declining. Uh, Italy, a, a few other countries. And Japan particularly has come up with a number of very creative, successful ways of dealing with population shrinkage in an, in an equitable and planned way. And, and that's what we should be promoting and thinking about rather than saying, oh, my God, population's declining. It's terrible. It's the worst thing that could happen. That's such such a silly short term way of thinking. Okay, well, I think we're at the end of our questions. I just want to thank you again so much for this great talk, and really, uh, really appreciate you tuning in all the way across the country um, to to speak to us out here, and um, and really appreciate your your thoughtfulness and and insights. So, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Be well. Okay. We'll, um, we'll, we'll uh, keep you posted and um, we'll send you a copy of the video when we get it edited as well. Thank you. Good night. Thank you so much. And all of us here. Hi, Steve. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs>